people using expressions like a new world is born, <laughs> uh, that, that people could contemplate going for operations without um, fear of the pain. People were refusing operations because of the fear of pain. James Simpson published a remarkable paper in the BMJ in 1847. He demonstrated that chloroform was a better anaesthetic than ether. But he went beyond that in championing the cause of the patient, arguing that reducing pain was important, especially the pain of childbirth. And he found himself opposed by the church, who argued that, that pain was a necessary part of the tribulation of giving birth. He wrote to his prospective father, not just before he got married, and he said that he would make his future by his pen and his lancet. And I think it's significant that he mentioned pen first, because he wrote a great deal and at great length. In one of his early publications, for example, I counted that he referred to no fewer than 243 books. <laughs> so he was very much a man in library medicine, and certainly the, the matter of publicising everything he did was very important to him. Another aspect of Simpson was the huge growth of journals at the time. And I think this was something that he really exploited. This was the period where the journal became the main means of uh, transmitting medical information, and Simpson took advantage of that. Did he publish frequently in the BMJ? I think he published about eight articles in the BMJ, uh, including the rather crucial hospitalism papers. And I think this is... And that's the one here. Uh, that, that's right. Well, one of them, yes. And I think that's an aspect of Simpson's career that has been overlooked, um, because really he was quite a pioneer when it came to hospital-borne infections. And he was pointing out that large hospitals were really rather dangerous places to be, suggesting that patients did better either at home or in much smaller hospitals, and indeed writing about changing the designs of hospitals, suggesting a pavilion-based system where not everybody would be grouped close together. Plus a change of the current concerns about um, hospital-based infection. Yes. Mm. The classic 1847 paper in the predecessor to the BMJ, that wasn't quite the first announcement of the use of chloroform, was it? No, he first announced it to uh, the Medical and Chirurgical Society in Edinburgh, and the BMJ published it as, as well. I'm always amazed at how quickly that, that happened. Um, but I think if anybody got publications in that fast now, <laughs> consider it miraculous. Chloroform possesses an agreeable, fragrant, fruit-like odour and a saccharine, pleasant taste. As an inhaled anaesthetic agent, it possesses, I believe, all the advantages of sulfuric ether without its principal disadvantages. A boy, four or five years old, with necrosis of one of the bones of the forearm. On holding the handkerchief to his face, he became frightened and wrestled to be away. He was held gently, however, and obliged to inhale. After a few inspirations, he ceased to cry or move and fell into a sound sleep. A deep incision was now made down to the diseased bone. Not the slightest evidence of the suffering of pain was given. This is the case book of the Public Royal Maternity Hospital. And you can see here, 1847, the first use of chloroform by Dr. Simpson. Chloroform then gets used by other practitioners and used with increasing frequency. But why chloroform? I mean, how did you discover that it might be an anaesthetic? Where did it come from? Well, that was that chemist, David Waldy. Another such. example of these interactions between chemists and, yeah. and medics are so important in pushing the subject forward. Well, the other thing is the self-experimentation, because Simpson yeah. was uh, uh, rather bravely carrying out um, experiments on himself and other practitioners. And there's the story of Hans Christian Andersen oh. coming to Simpson's house and being rather disapproving about uh, ether-sniffing parties that were taking place in the residence at 52 Queen Street, just along the street from here. And that's presumably because of the hallucinations and so on that are quite common. And that less frequent with chloroform, that's one of the points that he made in his early paper, isn't it? Yes. Ether had become a bit unpopular because they did one or two um, fatalities and so on, and it was a bit in decline. Um, so we don't hear about these these parties so much, you're quite right, with chloroform. Do you think it's true that Simpson tried out chloroform on his young daughter? He did it he, on his niece, Agnes Petrie, who was 16 at the time, and rather spoiled, and she demanded to be able to 
have a sniff of chloroform. And that's when she sort of went into ecstasies and rushed around the place saying, I'm an angel, I'm an angel. Of course, in the case of, of pain from childbirth, there was another complication, wasn't there? And that was the attitude of the church. He was very upfront in anticipating that there would be uh, attack from the church. But if you look at his correspondence, the, as he expected, the real opposition came from members of the medical profession. But why? Well, JYS was a bit sort of um, paranoid almost. He, was, he always expected opposition from his colleagues. He'd had a difficult start in his career. Um, the senior people in, in the, the profession in Edinburgh hadn't been terribly welcoming at the beginning because he was a member of the wrong political party. He was a Whig. He had been one of Robert Knox's students, for example, and had taken part in, in uh, body snatching and so on. But he was, in, he was in the radical end politics, and of course the establishment were very Tory. So he always felt he wasn't quite in the establishment. And I think that gave him this, um, this very combative uh, attitude to other people, and he expected the establishment and the profession to be against him. I have employed it, with few and rare exceptions, in every case of labour that I have attended, and with the most delightful results. And I have no doubt whatever that some years hence the practice will be general. Obstetricians may oppose it, but I believe our patients themselves will force the use of it upon the profession. When he started to write about anaesthetics, he must have thought that was hitting the jackpot. And it didn't really matter to him what the profession had to say about it. He knew that the weight of public opinion was going to be firmly behind him. And he said over and over again in things he writes, you know, that the, the public was with him. But he took very good care that they should be because he kept them informed. Is that why Simpson's funeral was probably the biggest Edinburgh has ever seen? Is that generally true that he wasn't very rigorous in his evidence collecting? When other practitioners wrote pamphlets or in other journals mentioning deaths caused by chloroform, and Simpson would go to great lengths to try and prove that chloroform was not the factor that was causing the death. He was like that all his career. Once he had stated the position he had taken up, he was very loath to move it on anything. <laughs>